end right now. So hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, uh, wherever you're joining from, I hope you're having a great Saturday. And uh, so we basically have two features here. We have a feature for your chat function and we also have a Q&A present. So feel free to leave all your comments in the chat section. And also if you have any questions for the speaker, do leave it in the Q&A and I'll make sure to sort of go through it in the end. And I hope you enjoyed today and let us just jump right into the presentation right now. So uh, good morning, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the presentation on how to contribute to CPython, the first steps. I am Archana. I am the leadership fellow uh, for Python and cloud for women of code. I co-lead this with Bree. And uh, I have here with me Sadna Srinivasan. So Sadna is from Bits Pilani. She has done her master's in mathematics and she has worked as a data scientist at Sama Technologies for two years. And apart from that, she has an interest in C Python and Python. And she has been contributing to this field for a very long time. And she'll be joining us today as a speaker. And we can learn so much from her today. Thank you so much for joining, Sadna. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, before we begin, we're just going to go through our mission. So Women Who Code has a mission of inspiring women to excel in technology careers. Our vision is to have a world where women are representatives as technical executives, founders, VCs, board members, and above all, software engineers. And we have a very strict code of conduct. What it basically states is that Women Who Code is an inclusive community. And if you have any incident reports for us, make sure to just leave it at this link. And without wasting any more time, I'm just going to pass it over to Sadna and let's just get it started. Okay. Um, thank you, Archana. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so um, let's get started. So what we'll cover is uh, basically, we're going to talk about how we can end up contributing to CPython. Um, what I'm looking for is, and what we're going to talk about is, um, we're going to talk about the internals of CPython. We're going to try to understand how um, the compiler works. We're going to talk about um, each of the different components. Then we're going to talk about um, the, the way CPython compiles to each specific system and how they've done it so that when you read the code in CPython, it's easy to do so. And we are also going to talk about um, the contribution cycle, where you can get help, uh, what mailing list should you follow, etc. So um, starting with what is CPython? Um, Python, like all programming languages, needs to be translated to run on a system. It needs to be translated from your text file, uh, which is a .py file, into your uh, machine code. And the compiler has all of the normal features that you would see. Um, you, you have a parser, you have a tokenizer, you have a compiler, and of course you have the interpreter. And Python is an interpreted language and that is because Python's interpreter does most of the work. So there are alternatives to CPython. You have Jython, which allows you to run Python within the Java framework. So you can execute snippets of Python while your entire code base is in Java, but just that can run in Python. You have Ion Python, which does similar things for the .NET framework. Um, you have PyPy, which is written in Python. Um, R Python is a sort of um, limited subset of Python. It is Python, but you can't do everything that you can normally do in Python. And it supports just-in-time compilation. Um, normally in Python, the code is compiled and then the interpreter runs through each line. But um, just in time means, uh, let's say you're gonna call a function. The function will only get compiled when you call it. Um, Stackless is a micro-threaded version of Python. It again makes a lot of code bases really fast if you need multi-threading. So CPython is the most official one. It's the one that Guido initially wrote and it's the one that's a general accept standard. So um, how does CPython work? What are the processes? So we write source code and the source code is directly given to the tokenizer. The tokenizer goes through the entire source code and produces a huge list of tokens. And 
what each token would look like is let's say there is an expression a, a plus b for example so it would have expression the name of the token and the actual value in the source code which in this case would be a plus b so that would get passed you have that whole list which would then go into the parser the parser will go through this entire list of tokens and then it will come up with an abstract syntax tree which is then fed into the compiler the compiler goes through this and it produces bytecode which is finally given to the interpreter and the interpreter gives us the output the most of the optimization in python most of um, all the tricks that happen happens in the interpreter so um, let's start with the um, tokenizer the tokenizer reads an input stream which is our python file and it finds the tokens in it and it goes character by character and it, it checks is, is this going to be a string is this going to be um, a, a, a variable so and it's implemented as this huge list of rules um, it checks like is, is this going to be a new line is this a quote could this be the start of an identifier, which is very important, which is what gets checked first every time. So um, this is a very simple representation that I picked up from a really good blog post. Um, so you start checking, could this be an identifier? So let's say um, you get A or B. Yeah, the a, a character is going to pass. It could potentially be an identifier. And then you go on to check other rules based on that. But if it doesn't pass and it's not a new line and it goes on, so each of these rules are checked in turn until one of them passes. And if none of them pass, that is when we get a syntax error. So let's go through a sort of um, example run. So here we have what is a string. And so it's ABC and it's bytes. So it reads the token and it's going to get the first token is B. And yeah, it could be a potential identifier. It's a letter. So we read the next one and it's a quote. So we're like, okay, no, this is actually a string. And then you return the string. So you, the token will look like um, a tuple, which has string, which is the name for this particular token and followed by B open quotes, ABC close quotes. So it goes through all of these loops and these are all controlled by go tos. Um, we will come back to this again later in the talk, but because it's controlled by GoTo's, even though normally GoTo's are really bad programming, this is really fast. So um, that's what the tokenizer does. So you have this whole um, list of tokens and what happens, it goes to the parser. Now, um, Python's parser is actually a parser generator. So based on the grammar that you have, the parser is generated. So Python uses the EBNF, which is the extended practice number form, which I'm not going to go into, but it allows you to do things like expression question mark, which means the expression may or may not be there, expression plus, which means you can have one or more. So it allows you to write those similar to regex kind of grammar rules, which can be very helpful for human readability. So um, this happened recently. Python's parser was changed, I think two weeks ago, approximately. So the old parser was called the LL1 parser and it had a lot of ambiguity. It had rules where you could say A or B and if A and B were both uh, correct, then you would need something else to come and solve the ambiguity. So when you looked at the grammar file from when this parser was used, it wasn't readable. Um, you could, it, it didn't reflect all of the grammar of Python. And what it did was um, instead of generating an abstract syntax tree, it generated a concrete one. So what that would mean is, let's say we have an expression A plus B plus C and that has to be parsed. The concrete syntax tree would just have the node expression and five children nodes, A, B, A plus B plus C, um, which is not what we want, which is not very good to know. It's, it's not gonna be compiled well. So what they did was they had another piece of software which would then take the uh, CST and then parse it and then compile it to an AST. And that AST would then be fed 
into the compiler and you had both of these trees living in memory which eats up a lot of memory and they um on top of all of this um the pegin parser you can find it at pegin.c the um, pegin parser was not very powerful so they had a rule which said if something cannot be parsed by this parser we're not going to add it to python but then they had to break their own rule to make sure something as fundamental as assignment would work properly because without those extra rules you could do 2 plus 2 equal to 5 and it would compile perfectly without any issues so the new parser is called the peg parser and it has no ambiguity so let's say you have a rule a or b or c and the expression that you have qualifies to be a b and c so what the parser would do it would always pick the leftmost one and it would go depth first and it would get you the largest parse tree possible so you are always going to get one particular parse tree for every time you run the program i mean for every time you run the parser on a specific program which is something you want which is something that's nice and it does not generate the cst it actually goes ahead and generates an abstract syntax tree and uh, this has been implemented in python as of um, 3.10 which is i think two weeks ago and um, it it has infinite lookup as in um, it will look at all the tokens in the source code before generating the abstract syntax tree and it still does it in order of n time so that is the peg parser i'm not going into too much detail about this um, because there are lots of talks which cover this in much more detail and it will take 40 minutes of its own but this is what it does i see a question shall i take the question now uh you can take it towards the end okay um yeah so once we get that abstract syntax tree we feed it into the compiler the compiler's job is pretty simple it takes the abstract syntax tree and it produces a control flow graph this graph is basically so we said that everything is going to be converted into a bytecode so you have bytecode blocks so when um the the flow graph is basically these bytecode blocks and the edges are the way you do jumps from one block to another and the compiler only does three things and what they are is you need to figure out the scope of a variable is it if you are in a function and then you exit the function it should know to destroy the variable if the references are zero and it compiles everything to bytecode from the um ast and it has to take this huge um control flow graph and flatten it into the into a list and calculate where all the jumps are supposed to be and give that information back to us um this is possible to do um for any python file that you have we just have to run python if and m um this and then the file name and that will give us an output so i came up with this really awesome function um to try and run it on so You, this is this function is just going to square a number and this is the output that you get so what do you have on your left are a list of op codes um or operation codes and what you have on your right are values that get added to the stack if it's zero nothing happens if it's one something happens to the stack we'll come back to that but this the this list of op codes is very important so and these are also the ones that are called more often so you load a constant which is you load the code object which was compiled then you're supposed to load the constant which is a function and that constant points to the position of the um code object function then you make that function and you store the name in your stack then you load the constant x add the value 5 to your stack and then you and then we have a function call so you actually call the function and then we are passing x so you load the name of x then you call the function and then it gets into the function context and it runs inside the function context we get back and we return a value and this output that we saw is what is fed into the interpreter the interpreter is basically this really huge 
infinite loop. Um, we will come back to this statement and we will come back to GoTo's, both are linked. And it, it only works with opcodes. And all of the opcodes are defined in opcode.h. So you can actually take a look if you want. I think there are over 200 to 300 opcodes. So this is the actual loop. Um, the line numbers are based off, I, I, today morning I got the C, Python, this thing. So the line numbers are pretty accurate for today, but later they might change. And for every loop, it checks whether the stack is fine. Is there an overflow or an underflow? If not, it goes on to evaluate any one opcode. And that opcode is the is chosen by a switch. So you have a huge for loop and then you have a switch case and that's what your interpreter loop is. So you check your opcode, you go to the correct opcode and you execute what's there. So let's take a look at one particular opcode. This is called load fast. Um, what it does is it loads a variable into memory. Um, that's all it does. So you get the argument from wh whatever argument you have. So we saw we have zero, one or two, which defines specific things that you do to the stack. So it gets that and it checks whether there's some error, like did something go wrong? We're gonna assume that it didn't. Um, and then it increments the reference to that value. So this is very important because um, stuff like strings we know are immutable and you can have multiple references to that string and that memory will only get released when all of the references come down to zero. So this, is, this reference counting is very, very important for Python's garbage collection. So that happens, so it increases the reference to that value and then it pushes the value onto the stack and then it moves on. Okay. So how does a program run? I've been talking about stacks. I've been saying a lot of things about stacks, but how does it actually run? So we're gonna come back to our very interesting function. And we're also gonna take a look at this function from the C Python um, code. So this is from ceval.c, which is where the entire interpreter loop is written down. So what it does is um, it define this particular function, takes a frame as an input, runs the frame and gives you an output. So what is a frame? Um, so we have scopes and you can, so whenever you get into a function scope, you're getting into that particular frame. And when you're not in any function, you're just in main, you're in the global frame. So it's, it's a way to handle all of these scopes and each frame has a value stack of its own. So whenever I say something is added to the stack or taken away from the stack, it's added to this value stack or taken away from this value stack. So we're gonna go through an example. Initially, the global frame is empty. Um, for this function that we're going through. Initially, the global frame is empty. We haven't looked at any code yet. And when we do, the first thing that we see is that we've defined a function called func. So um, the, the code object is compiled and a pointer to that code object is stored in the global frame. And then the next thing we've done is we've defined x is equal to five. Um, okay, here I've taken 10. So x is equal to 10. So um, the value 10 is loaded and then the name x is loaded and all of this is stored in the global frame. And then we call the function. So a different frame is produced and it goes into that frame and this function is called to run that frame. So we have the function frame and we passed the variable x to that function. So 10 is loaded into the value stack of the function frame. The name x is loaded into the value stack of the function frame. And then the return statement is computed. For us, it was x is squared. So we get 100 and that value is returned. And it just goes to the global frame. The global frame returns and it exists. We're not doing anything with the function. So this would be the end of the program. So another thing that I have to talk about, um, which is something that we will notice in the C Python code base is that um, everything is a pi object until you need it to be something else. We know that in Python, everything is an object 
and in cpython everything is a pi object so in and the reason why this is done is that in cpython in c as such there is no sense of classes so writing clean code and doing object oriented programming is really difficult and this is the workaround that they have so when you need an object to act like an integer let's say you will say okay cast this as a pi int object and then you will use whatever function you need with that so in a pi object you're always going to have four values you're always going to have the type of object that this object is supposed to be the unique id of the object which can be used to update reference counts and refer to that object the value it stores and the number of references that that object currently has as in the number of other objects referring to that for now um and let's say you have two pi objects and you want to add them and you want to add them as integers you cast both of those objects as integers and then you add them this is also one of the reasons why duck typing works you only cast something when you need it to be somewhere in c python so you can use duck typing normally in python um so this um there was a new um feature we could say in c which um allowed people to work with go tos in a slightly different way so we've seen that we have this big infinite loop and it has a switch case and that's not very efficient so what computed go tos allows is you can circumvent all of these while loops and switches by using go to labels but the awesomeness of this is that um the actual label that you go to can be computed during runtime and this um ends up saving so much speed that between 2019 when this was imp implemented to now uh, python has sped up almost two times so let's take a look at how this works so um the entire computed go to system is based off this one particular function so we saw that the last line of the um of the op code execution was fast dispatch and that calls this function um what this function does is it reads the next op code figures out what the next um label should be and then it tells go to to jump to that label that's all this function does and it makes the code really fast um this is that example so it would come to this case without having to go through the switch without having to reset the loop it just comes here um and now we talk about how um c python is compiled it runs on very many different systems we know that you need the latest version of c for the compile go to to work but not every system has the latest version of c but by python still runs so it's it compiles in different ways in different systems and one of the most important ways in which it does that is it uses the environment variables that you have in your system to figure out which parts of the code should actually be present in the final compiled um file so i'm simplifying here but okay so um this is um ll trace this example is based of ll trace so ll trace allows you if you have ll trace on you can trace the workings of c python you can see um what are the where, where is memory going you can see um you know exactly what is happening when you execute a line of python code so this might be important for a lot of people so they might always have it on so they compile c python to have it on um and if you have it on then the first fast dispatch will be the one that gets compiled if you don't have it on you will have the second one and that is what these if defs and else is are for um this is important to know because you will see a lot of these across almost all the files in c python and it it makes it hard to read but if you know it's fine and another thing that they use a lot is macros um i said that 
using GoTo's jumps to this particular case, but th there is no label right here. So that gets inserted during runtime. So you have this definition. So this target OP in our case, um, noop. So you will have case noop colon and in the next line target noop OP. And that is the label for noop OP and then fast dispatch will dispatch you to that position. So I hope things are kind of getting tied up for this. And those are all the components of CPython. And if you actually try to read CPython right now, if you try to read the code base, it should be pretty clear what each of the um, sections do. It should be pretty clear when you read the C code, um, what is actually happening. Um, the code base itself is pretty readable. Um, as long as you know what the overarching goals for each file are, and that's what we've tried to do. So um, what is the contribution process like? So the life of a PR, um, the Python issues are not on GitHub. They exist on the Python issues tracker. And the way this generally works is you pick up an issue and you tell people that you're working on it. This is very important because a lot of people might be working on the issue you want to work on, coming up with different solutions. What might seem like a really simple issue might not be that simple and there might be a lot of fixes going on. Uh, you might still be able to contribute um, uh, and propose a new fix if you can think of it. And um, a lot of times the code developers do help you out when you say you want to contribute to this, they'll tell you what is going on. And it's really useful to tell people you're working on something before you try to work on it. And then you solve it and you send a PR with the correct title. This is also very important. Um, otherwise, the tracking of all the bugs gets, it, it gets pretty ugly and um, your PR will probably not get accepted. So the title is really important. And once you do this, you also need to update the issue tracker saying that you have done this. Most of the people who work are really, or work on CPython are really busy, so they need to get notified. So that happens. And then there are review process. The rest is the same as any other open source projects. So this is the process. Um, another very important thing is the mailing list. So you have three main mailing lists, Python ideas, where new ideas are discussed like do we want to um, change the syntax of Python? What do other people think? So that's what's happening in ideas. Python dev is about all of the changes that are currently happening. Um, what is the position of these things? Should we use this fix or that fix? So that's what Python dev is for. Um, core mentorship is when we have doubts. If you have any doubt and you want a core mentor, um, core contributor to respond to that, that's when you use core mentorship. Um, if you want to know where you could contribute other than um, solving bugs, but where you could contribute to try and, try and bring new features, one of the best ways to start is to start with um, PEPs that have been accepted. Um, a PEP is a Python enhancement proposal and all of them are kept track of in PEP0. Um, so some of the ones that have been accepted but are still not completed are uh, the peg parts of a Python, which is basically, um, we, which we touched upon recently. The reason it's not completed is that there are some extra functionalities that they want to add and um, you can help contribute to that. Um, there are positional, they, another accepted type is positional only parameters. Um, right now, all your parameters are named, but instead you can just have positional only and that is something that people are working on. Another thing that's really interesting is to have runtime audit hooks. So um, you have hooks from the Python program directly into C Python to pull the exact line and you get an entire audit history of how it was run in C Python. That's another thing that people are working on, which you could potentially contribute to. So that's what I had to say. I, I understand that this is a lot of um, information that has been given to you, but if you try to go and read CPython now, it should be reasonably clear. So thank you and I'm open to questions.
Thank you so much, Sadna. Uh, I really love the presentation. I think I especially love the part about contributing to Python. A lot of us, I think, don't understand the value behind, you know, actually developing stuff in, you know, an open source language. And, you know, there are a lot of people who put in a lot of hard work to make sure that this, you know, this language is what it is. And I, I believe like, you know, once you start, you know, falling in love with the language, the first thing that you want to learn is like, you know, how can I contribute? How can I give back? And Python, I believe, is the perfect place to do that because you can actually end up contributing, right? Yes. Uh, and another reason is, um, I think it's important for two reasons. One, if you try to contribute to Python, you learn C for free. And two, the code base is really Pythonic. Even though it is written in C, it's really Pythonic. So you expect certain things to be the way they are, and they are that way, which is nice. Yeah, that is true. Uh, I haven't checked out the code base yet, but you know, you're giving your presentation today. I'll you know for sure go ahead and check out the code base. I think I also love the part about the fact that you know you can't find PRs on the tracker. I think it's something that a lot of us take for granted. And we always think, you know, the first thing that we ought to do when we start contributing to open source is go look at, you know, uh, you know, the tracker and find out how to submit PR. So I think that's a very good uh, thing to point out. And a lot of people will, I think, sort of understand that. So yeah, I'll go ahead and open this for questions. And uh, we actually have four questions for you. And uh, before we jump in, I would love for you to sort of, you know, contribute more questions in because, you know, I know this is a little bit of a complex topic, but all of us has to have to like start somewhere. So, you know, uh, feel free to go ahead and post it. I bet Sadhna was right where you were, uh, you know, a few years or a, a year back or how long was it Sadhna before you started contributing? A year back. Exactly. I so I mean, I cold mail Guido last PyCon and then started contributing. Yeah. <laughs> that is the best. Like you, you can cold mail people in the core team and find out how to contribute, you know. <laughs> they respond. <laughs> exactly. So that's really wonderful. I mean, which other language supports you to do that? So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and start uh, asking you a couple of questions. Yeah. So the first question is, what language is the parser written in? And does the parser read the Python script as a file? Um, the parser does, okay, the parser is written in um, C and Python. So it was initially written in C and then it was translated into Python. So you can find both versions of it. Um, but the actual one that will be shipped with C Python is written in C for the sake of speed. Um, but you can read the Python version of the parser too. Um, I'll, I'll add a list of um, places that you can see all of this in on where the talk is posted. Um, and the parser does not touch the source file. The parser only looks at the output of the tokenizer. Got it. Uh, and someone also said that they really liked your slides and they really like the code. That's something that I also really like. I sort of put up code on Colab and I realized this putting it up on a black screen looks so much clearer. So kudos on that, Sadhna. And, <laughs> and we have another question here. What is the advantage of using C Python over J Python? And when do you use one over the other? Um, well, each of them has a very, very specific use case. Normally, you use C Python. Um, if you want your Python code to run within Java, then you use Jython. If you want your Python code to run within the .NET framework, then you use Ion Python. If you want your Python compilation to be really fast and only compile things that you need when you need them, then you use PyPy. So it varies heavily with usage, but generally C Python is a good bet. Got it. That's an interesting answer. Uh, so is is only way to keep touch is to keep going back to the docs again and again. Is there a place where, you know, they update the information in an interactive manner? Someone wants to know that. Uh, update what information? I think like sort of like, uh, I bet the PRs and all. Yeah, you have to look at the tracker. The mailing list, I think weekly also gives you a summary. Like everybody is mailed a summary of what happened that week, what is open, what was closed, etc. So that could also be a good thing, but the bugs tracker is where you're going to go if you want to look at the status of mostly anything. 
yeah and as you said it's quite pythonic in nature so i think it should be easy to sort of understand and go through yeah uh, yeah and i think someone even has a basic question here someone is asking what exactly is go to and like could you maybe go over that again and what exactly does it do okay so um go to is something that we use in c um let's say you have oh, i wish i could write so let's say you have a program and you have to do it line by line and you're in line 10 let's say and from this line 10 you want to go to line 5 so you want to change the control flow one of the initial ways that people figured out how to do this was to put a label in the line you wanted to go to and then tell the program to go to that label so it will just search and then go to that label that's what a go to is it's considered really bad programming because you can change the control flow in terrible ways and have terrible bugs and it was bad but now it makes things really fast so we use them and compile go tos so before the go to and the label was a static label that you had to give now it's a variable that will hold a label so you can just tell it during runtime go to this place so during runtime you're changing the control flow of the program what it what it is yeah i have never actually really thought of that so <laughs> uh okay someone also has a question is c python the language engine for python as opposed to the programming language python uh the programming language is a standard it can be implemented by many compilers the oh. standard implementation that was first done by guido is c python oh uh, there are other versions that's what pypy jaitan are all they are all equivalent except they are useful in very specific situations got it and uh, someone also asked a few days i started reading the code base and being an active reader i sort of mailed all the groups you know python dev python ideas i lost persistence on somewhere how do you keep persistence on contributing to python repo that's a very good question actually like how do you you know keep your spirits up or uh, to sort of find out where the bug is and sort of you know make sure that you are actually contributing so like um i i think this comes down to normal productivity i can talk about what i do personally is i use habitica and try to gamify the whole thing um oh, but <laughs> but maybe you could have reminders to remind you to mail people but i've noticed that if you put it in core mentorship and you're asking for help it's much quicker because python ideas is meant for discussing certain things that could potentially be implemented in python and python dev is for discussing fixes and differences that you want do you want this pep approved etc so if you really want help and you want it fast then co mentorship is a good way to go and they also want to know what was your pushing factor to actually you had for contributing to the python repo like what made you sort of go ahead and contribute <laughs> um so uh i think this was last year just before the pycon i figured out that python is a really hard la- language to know it's really confusing um i mean you have all of these meta classes and i was trying to go through the simpice um base and try to figure out certain things for a project and i had to keep going deeper and deeper and eventually i was like why is everything this way and then i got to the C Python compiler, and then I had my piece. So that's why. So does it like go like you know when when do you know you're reaching the end? Like, uh, I don't do you think know? you do. I don't think you do. I don't think I've reached the end. There's something happening in C Python all the time, and um, I mean, you go from having language problems to thinking about um, how do you do parsers, how do you do optimization. So it becomes this entire thing and as a math person with a math background this is all quite new and quite interesting <laughs> absolutely i i can only imagine uh we have another question here are the pull requests labeled as to whether they are beginner friendly the issues are usually labeled but it's best to talk about the problem before just claiming it because um it's labeled in the issue tracker you have to go to bugs.python.org if i remember right but don't quote me on that so um there they, i mean i don't remember the url so there they are labeled 
but it's best to ask people because very something that looks small might actually turn out to be big it's best to talk about it got it uh someone actually went ahead and posted the issue so yay <laughs> so um thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts today uh, sadhana like we really loved the presentation today i think it was like everything we sort of wanted and you know i i bet like someone you know we sort of took away what exactly maybe c python is and how exactly you know we, maybe we can contribute in the future and i think it's very important to sort of uh make sure that we contributing back to the language and make sure we keep this open source spirit up and i think you bought that out perfectly today so thank you so much for doing that so uh everyone like feel free to leave your feedback uh on through this qr uh qr code uh link and you can also find link to sadhana slides you can find link to how to reach her you can also find links to how to reach us that is women who code python track and thank you so much for joining in today and uh if there are any more questions i'll make sure to send it over to sadhana and then make sure that they can you can uh, you can end up answering it thank you so much and uh, i hope you have a very nice day thank you have a nice day too bye 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 hello